so you both sort of touched on this in your introductions. Um, and, you know, some people may argue that if the simulation implies some intelligent designer, that it's basically the equivalent to some ontotheological view where there's no, you know, thus it's like not really different from a religion that postulates some sort of an, an omnipotent designer, a deity of some sort. Others might contend that the simulation doesn't necessarily require some intelligent agent to run it um, and that it could arise from some sort of natural phenomena. Do you see any distinction between this sort of naturalistic explanation for a possible simulation versus a theological one? We'll start. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I like the way that David put it in his talk that like the, the the simulation hypothesis is sort of like an amalgamation of two things right where you believe like the world is computational in a certain appropriate sense and there was some creator who who decide you know made a choice to set that in motion right you could imagine that this universe is just arises you know mechanistically out of a different universe with you know utterly different laws but like in a certain sense that is what physics already says Right. So it's like the classical world, you know, is built out of this quantum world that, you know, that looks, you know, that looks totally different from anything that you, you know, a priori thought about. Right. It was like, is, you know, is, is classical physics just all, you know, a big simulation being run by quantum physics? Well, like you could view it that way. Like, I don't I don't I personally don't see where to draw a firm line between that sort of thing. You know, just levels of emergence and one world simulating another world. OK. David? Got, is too, you, know, you can define the simulation hypothesis the way you were suggesting so that it doesn't actually require a simulator. So interesting question. Just say it turns out that we're in a, yeah, we're contained in a world where just through totally by chance, a simulation of our universe came into existence. Then yeah. is the simulation hypothesis true? Well, I think this is kind of, it's a, it's a verbal question. We can stipulate, we can stipulate, in my book, I stipulate that the simulation hypothesis requires a simulator who okay. designed and created this intentionally. So this would not count. But it's an interesting question. Is there, a, there are certainly going to be hypotheses that, that don't have a simulator. And uh, it's an uh, interesting question whether any of those are plausible. The one I mentioned is just like a Boltzmann brain, Boltzmann simulation. <laughs> Maybe could be, could, be, uh, could be terrible that way. Maybe there are versions where you said naturalistic version where somehow universes evolve as on one of those. Isn't at least Smolin who had uh, the yeah. you know, yeah. universes yeah. evolving? Maybe that could happen with simulations. Right. I did uh, I want to say, I mean, so, so I'm really glad that David, uh, uh, you know, covered the quantum mechanics part so I don't have to, right? <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, I was thinking, like, there are so many areas of agreement that I was thinking, like, what could we actually have a fight about here? I might have found something uh, that, okay, well, like like you said, that, like, even I would agree that the, uh, presumably, that, that, that it's meaningful whether we're in a simulation or not, right? You, you, even assuming that there was no way to get any, evidence about it. And uh, I, I think for me, I, I would only say that it's pre-meaningful, right? Well, you know, like, like I'm willing to hear out the arguments for why it's meaningful, but I know that the answer is going to look like, well, on these philosophical views, it's meaningful, and on these other philosophical views, it isn't, right? And then, you know, so the question, like, do, do, do you guys ever resolve these things? Like, <laughs> there were, the, you know, the, lo the logical empiricists or logical positivists of the 1930s had this famous hypothesis, verificationism. For a hypothesis to be meaningful, it's got to be verifiable. And then there's the closely related falsification version. For it to be meaningful, it's got to be falsifiable. And I think, yeah, in this case, it looks like the perfect simulation hypothesis may not be falsifiable. Most philosophers these days do not ex roundly reject this verificationist thesis. They say things like, is that thesis verifiable or falsifiable? <laughs> sure, but I, I don't have to be like a strict, like an orthodox yeah, verificationist fair. in order to say, well, you've given me this hypothesis, but you haven't told me yeah. what to do, right? And therefore, like, I'm willing to hear you out, but like, convince me that it's meaningful. What moves me the most is <laughs> thinking about, we could actually create someone for whom the simulation hypothesis is true. We could take a brain in a vat or make a, make a simulated universe in which there is a cognitive system who is precisely interacting with a uh, computer simulation in a way which was totally unverifiable or unfalsifiable for that person. If we do a good enough job with the simulation, they will never know. But it just seems obvious. They are, in fact, in a simulation. This is a, a coherent way for a being to be. Now, like you say, isn't that at least a coherent possibility that we're in that situation? Go. Very interesting. Um, there's this interesting and I would say very disturbing thought experiment that emerged in the AI safety and effective altruism community a few years ago called Roca's Basilisk. Have you ever heard of this? 
Um, so it's already gotten probably like a hundred thousand times more discussion than it merits. But wasn't yeah, this thing that's probably true. Wasn't yeah. this thing responsible for getting Elon Musk and uh, it, was, it was, yeah, that was how they met. Yeah. Talking. So for anyone unfamiliar with this, um, it states that any otherwise benevolent artificial superintelligence in the future would necessarily be incentivized to create a virtual reality simulation to torture anyone who knew of its potential existence, but who did not directly contribute to its advancement or development in order to incentivize that advancement. So as you can imagine, this caused a lot of sleepless nights and panic attacks amongst the members of the EA community. Um, so my question is, if there is some intelligent simulator that exists, do you think we're in trouble for talking about this? Like, do we owe some piety to whoever the simulator may or may not be? Scott is the AI safety professional. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just made my piece a long, you know, a long time ago with the idea that okay, if I'm going to be, you know, punished for eternity for, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> some 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 rule that I didn't even know that I was breaking because I didn't know which religion was the true one or whatever, then you know, that's to, you know, them's the breaks, right? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> there is the view that this, yeah, the the, mo the simulators are going to shut us down the moment we realize we realize that we're in a simulation. So yeah. actually, there's a way of understanding this is actually very close to Hegel. On um, Hegel said, you know, history will end at the moment when the world becomes conscious of itself, <laughs> of its own true nature. So it's like the moment we realize we're in a simulation, yeah. that is when we become conscious of the true nature of our world, and the simulators will shut us down. I hope not, though. Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, which people have to realize it? Because I'm wondering whether this might already be falsified. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, people believe it, but do they know it? Right. Right. Ah, good. Uh, good. 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 Right. <laughs> Very interesting. So, uh, Dave, you mentioned uh, Nick Bostrom's argument for the simulation hypothesis, and I think a lot of what he talks about it rely. It's basically a probabilistic argument where he says that you know, in, if a high fidelity simulated reality is possible then it's highly improbable that we live in the base reality and that we're likely in a sim. What are your thoughts on this probabilistic argument? You don't like it, right? Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, I already responded to it, right? I said, in some sense, it's sawing off the branch that it sits on because, you know, you like what, when you take it seriously, like, like the picture it leads to is like a, is like a tree of like where each world can simulate worlds, which in turn can simulate other worlds and so forth. And then you say, well, okay, but why would we be at the, at the base of the tree? Right. But okay. But, but wait a minute, these simulations should be repeatedly, you know, getting smaller, right? Because each one has to run on computers that fit in, you know, the next universe above it, right? And there's always some overhead in a simulation. And so actually, it seems like, you know, in this universe, we should only be able to simulate smaller universes, right? And, and only a bigger, more complex universe can simulate this one. And, you know, in which case, like, what do we even mean when we say that our, our descendants are going to be simulating us? Mm -hmm. Right. They're going to be simulating some smaller universe that maybe, you know, has something right. But or, you know, unless you believe that we were in the smaller universe already. But but then, you know, then th then you just get too confused. <laughs> <laughs> On the other hand, if we're the simulation, maybe this, this universe, we've already got evidence that this universe is a pretty big one uh, with a lot of spare computing power for simulating universes. A lot of, the world yeah. simulating us could be bigger. Right. Stuff, all right? the all those galaxies going to waste. What are they doing? Right? Exactly. <laughs> So Susan and I have taught, have written a lot about this idea of algorithmic incompressibility or where we postulate that there are certain processes like complex processes that are not necessarily mappable to some sort of a mathematical abstraction. Um, you know, like you can think about the emergence of markets in an economy or something like that, these kinds of processes. And so, you know, we're torn between whether or not this is an epistemic thing where we simply don't have the knowledge to understand these things yet, or maybe it represents some sort of an ontological limit in terms of, you know, calculability or computability. So, Along that line, if there if there is some sort of a computable limit to the universe, like some sort of a computability horizon, do you think something like that could be evidence of a of a simulation in that we're in some sort of a computer that, you know, can only compute up to this, the power of the computer doing the simulating on the outside? I, I mean, if the natural world works anything like, you know, science thinks it works since Galileo, right, then the answer to your question has to be, you know, it is epistemic, right? It is, you know, if we had enough knowledge of this, you know, the state of every particle, right, if you knew the complete state of the universe, let's say the quant wave function of the universe at a given time, then you could run the equations forward, and that would tell you not only what the particles are, are, are doing or the probabilities for them to do each possible thing, it would tell you what the markets are. Are going to do ultimately because that that supervenes on it right yeah. so uh um yeah but I think we, <laughs> we are actually in a way in the situation you mentioned we seem to be 
in a Turing computable universe. Yeah. And we've gotten used to that and so on, but you know, your reasoning is now, hey, shouldn't the fact that we're in a Turing computable universe make us kind of suspicious about something? Like maybe we're actually inside a computation in the uh, in the next universe hub. Yeah. Right, but, but, but suppose that we had these, you know, Found, we found things on the beach that could solve the halting problem, right? So now we know that we're in a hyper touring. Then our notion of computability would just be the hyper touring one. And we'd say, whoa, well, 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 why are we in a hyper touring universe? It must be because we're simulated by a hyper touring machine, right? So, like, the, this is like, there's not something specific here about touring, right? That this, yeah. It'd be really interesting if it turns out that physical processes all show up in some, you know, way lower than Turing computable mm -hmm. class of. Mm -hmm processes like they're all, they're all ones that can be executed in a computer with this very small finite memory yeah. right. that might tell us something like, like well, you know they're like one of the long running jokes in quantum computing is that when the first person builds a scalable quantum computer and they try to run it to you know factor let's say a 2000 digit number you know break cryptography using shor's algorithm like that's going to be the event that crashes the universe Right, because you know, <laughs> the, you know, the, you know, the universe is running in some like lazy classical simulation where they know that they can usually ignore the you know hard enough quantum computations because those never actually happen, right? And then you know, the first when we try to build quantum computers, that's when we're going to break that abstraction, and there there just won't be enough computing power in the simulators. I think actually when I I had my my uh, 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 one meeting ever with uh, with with Larry Page, uh, that that was what he wanted to talk about, and uh, so I thought. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I guess, you know, maybe maybe you know more than me about, about you know, whether we're all in a simulation. But <laughs> <laughs> I hear that's what they're trying to do in DeepMind, too. They're just trying to stress test the simulation with, with really powerful AI and make it crash. So so I, I'm a professor at a university that f serves the intelligence community. So I'm naturally interested in, like, national security-related problems. Mm. Um, so the other day I was Googling national security implications of the simulation argument, and, like, unsurprisingly, there's not really a lot out there on this topic other than, like, some kind of, like, off-the-wall conspiracy theory kind of things. Um, Maybe the simulators are going to, like, take our stuff and feed it to, like, foreign powers. <laughs> well, I guess my question is, so, like, I'm interested in how emerging technologies technologies or emerging ideas within tech, um, you know, may impact global security and stability. So my question is, do you think that any confirmed knowledge of a simulated reality could disrupt the existing social order in some way? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but you know, have, have, having said that, like, I, I mean, okay, a AI, you know, like, like it used to be laughed off as, you know, as like, you know, a AGI is like a, a science fiction concern that just, you know, this small community of nerds fret about. Right? Like, <laughs> within the last couple of years, I think like, no, you know, there's been a phase change. You know, no one disputes anymore that it's a national security issue, right? I think, you know, I would need to see several things happen that haven't happened before I would want to say that whether the universe is a computer simulation should be a national security issue. Yeah. I mean, a lot would depend on, on how we got this confirmed knowledge, you know. Right. Maybe like if the simulators start talking to us and say, hey, I'm going to like, uh, here, let me just hack the code of the simulation right now and turn the Empire State Building upside down and so right. on. You bet that would be a national security issue. Absolutely. Like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I mean, I, I just, it just feels like we would have bigger fish to fry than, you know, like, what is what is simulated China doing against us now, right, or whatever. <laughs> this is like an intra-world, what's the word, not international security issue, but intra-world, intra-cosmos <laughs> security issue. <laughs> inter-world. Inter-world. Yeah. <laughs> so, Dave, in Reality Plus, you discussed how, and you mentioned it in your talk earlier, um, how virtual, how any sort of virtual reality is, in fact, real in like an ontological sense. Can you elaborate a bit on that? Yeah, you know, this is, I mean, the standard view of virtual reality, I mean, as I was saying, this whole idea of like simulated worlds goes back to, you know, there was uh, Plato in the cave and Zhuangzi with uh, the dream hypothesis and so on. And the standard, and Descartes with evil demons fooling him. The standard view is always, if you're in these simulation-like scenarios, nothing is real. Mm -hmm. Now the, uh, the contemporary version is virtual reality, actually very timely, Tomorrow, Apple is releasing their uh, Reality Pro, uh, their their first virtual reality device. Although they don't call it that, right? It's uh, I don't yeah. know, it's a spatial computing device. I've ordered mine. It's coming on Saturday. <laughs> um, and again, the standard view is that if you're in VR, none of this is real. It's a fiction. It's a hallucination. It's an illusion. I really want to argue that uh, no, this is wrong. Objects in VR are, are they genuinely exist? They're real. They have causal powers. They're digital. They're digital, but we now know that being digital is not a way of being unreal. 
I mean, you know, there's that that phrase IRL, right? In real life, where it's like <laughs> there's the re- there's, there's there's the digital and the real, but we know that's totally you know it's a really bad way of thinking about uh, about reality. So in general, I would, and likewise, I think thinking about the simulation hypothesis mm-hmm. and it from bit and so on can lead you down the road to thinking that actually, if we're in a simulation, all this stuff is genuinely real. That only applies to grand scale metaphysical theorizing. On the other hand, the case of VR is something which you know this is these are worlds that we're going to be in increasingly more mm-hmm. um, over the next over the next few decades. And I think it's really it's actually quite important whether these things are just fully illusions, hallucinations, hallucinations, and escapism, or whether they're a form of real world in which you can have meaningful experiences. So that's what I in the book I try and argue that at least in principle you can have real meaningful lives in VR. Very interesting. Do you think that if we ever were able to simulate a high enough fidelity uh, virtual reality here, would we ever be able to tell whether or not any of the sims in that environment in, in that environment are p zombies or whether or not they have consciousness? And then, sort of by extension, do you think that any simulator that exists outside of our reality would know whether or not uh, any entities in this reality are in fact conscious? Yes, you know there is this problem of other minds. It's very hard to know whether another creature is conscious, even given its uh, its behavior. I've always taken the view that at least, you know, if a system is behaving enough like us, it doesn't prove that they're conscious. They could be zombies. But nonetheless, it kind of ought to create a presumption Mm -hmm. of consciousness in us if they're from all this sophisticated behavior. But now, in the era of large language models, which are, they're not yet at the point of being Turing indistinguishable from us, but, you know, they're not that far off. And a lot of people, at least, uh, wanting to say, well, come on, there's actually good reason to think they're not conscious, or at least not strong reasons for extending them that uh, that presumption. So I think language models have, you know, they've already make make a lot of people think the Turing test is much less useful than we thought it might be as a test for consciousness. Um, but then we have nothing else to take its place. So I think right now, actually, we're rather confused about that issue. Yeah, very good. Scott, do you have anything you want to add to any of those? Questions? No, no, no. I mean, are we going to open things up? Yeah, absolutely. That's my next. Okay, yeah. That's my next thing. Oh wow, we have a lot. Okay. Um, do we have a microphone for? Yeah, we do. Okay. Awesome. All right. This is for Scott and for David. And Scott's probably going to get upset at me for asking something like this. But you know, what if I've always kind of thought about the simulation in terms of? Okay, you're talking about being inside or outside of a system. How can those things interact? So I always kind of saw it as something more of like a a self simulation if you're i mean if you're inside of the sim, if you're inside of something and you have no means of of judging if there's anything outside of it how can you even make the argument that there's something exterior even the fact that we can just think about these things what does that you know what are the implications of that I, I mean, that's exactly what we were talking about, right? I, you know, I, I started my remarks with saying, well, you know, the first thing I want to know is does it, does it make any difference to anything or not, right, that I can observe? If it doesn't make any difference, well, then, you know, I'm, I, at the very least, I need to hear an argument for why I should then care further about this, right? Yeah. You said self-simulation as in, oh, this is a simulation by ourselves? You know, the way I kind of look at it is, is okay, how can we not add anything else, look for anything else in just normal perception, daily life, whatever. How can we change our interpretation to where it's, it's, there's no boundary. Like if you're, if, for example, if you're inside of, I've given this example before to people, like if you're inside of, inside of a sphere and you have no means of judging anything from the outside, does it's effectively useless to you? I mean, it's kind of, again, to, to Scott's point. And when I say self, I mean like it's self-contained. There's not like an exterior. There's only an, an interior, but you can't even... The extreme version of this is the dream hypothesis, right? Right, yeah. It's you yourself who are creating the simulation. That's really a epistemic bubble. <laughs> I mean, I mean, there are many analogous issues, right? Like mathematicians might have once thought that, okay, you it only makes sense to talk about a curved surface if it's embedded in some higher dimensional, you know, flat space. And then, you know, eventually they realize, no, you can just intrinsically talk about, you know, your c- curved manifold in however many dimensions. And, you know, it, it could be embedded in something higher dimensional, but you also, you know, you don't even have to 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 to, to, to think about that if you don't want to. Very good. Um, Michael? Uh, I don't really see why you would, if you wanted to like know what, what a, how a civilization might like go and behave and stuff, I don't see why you would um, simulate that civilization with actual people. If I were to do it, I would create a, what I would call a puppet master simulation where there's an AI on top, and what that AI is doing is it has a bunch of puppets, which have various like um, personalities and like stuff like that. And the uh, the 
they're perceiving various things and the AI on top um, figures like knows how like its characters and stuff are going to react to those stimuli and have them react in that way. And therefore you can like use that to simulate an entire like uh, civilization without actually having like people in it essentially. And if you were to do this, then that AI on top could have its characters overlook any like flaws or cracks in the simulation. So it could be a lot less intensive. I mean, of course we can appeal to the anthropic principle here, right? If there are some simulations with no sentient beings and there are others with sentient beings, then we have to be in the latter kind. I mean, this is a premise of um, some of those original simulation fiction, right? Like Simulatron 3, which was uh, it was all... Yeah, the simulation, I think, was devised by people from an advertising company for marketing reasons. They wanted to see, you know, which program, which product was going to do well with people. But for that to be useful in a social context... Don't you have to simulate people? It's like if I simulate a world without people, it's not going to be terribly useful for navigating, for for you know governing my actions at least in this in this uh, social world. Actually, it gets even worse because if, if we now have simulation technology, you're going to have to simulate a world where people have simulation technology, and that rapidly gets recursive and, and difficult. <laughs> I guess when we talk about like simulation theory slash arguments like hypothesis, um, the concept of you mentioned infinite regression or recursion comes into mind. So if it's the case that we are in a simulation and if it's the case that there is a creator, there's probably then an equal or I will say even higher chance that the world of the creator is also simulated. And if that's simulated, there's a higher chance that the creator of the creator of the creator's world is also simulated. And I guess that could go like infinitely. So and even beyond that into the countable ordinals and the Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I guess will that sort of lead us into like a perpetual like uncertainty about like the underlying principles of reality, and is that the case or not? And if it is, is that something like worth considering? This is like is it, is it William James to whom the remark was attributed? It's like he he gave a lecture and in the end someone came up to him and said, "Look, James, your metaphysics is all wrong. Here's the correct metaphysics of reality. We're all sitting on the back of a turtle." <laughs> and they said, well, wait, what's the turtle on? Oh, it's, it's, it's another turtle. And then William James says, wait, wait, wait. and they said, no, no, I know where you're going. It's turtles all the way down. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, on, on, so likewise, for simulation, for a simulation, that one's in a simulation. Maybe it's simulations all the way up. Either way, it's like you have to, this kind of raises a very deep philosophical question, which is, does there have to be a fundamental level to reality? Uh, the philosopher Jonathan Schaffer wrote a nice article saying, no, there doesn't have to be. It can be like, there can levels all the way down to uh, to infinity. But if you're inclined to think that there has to be a fundamental level, then uh, presumably we're going to have to be at some fixed point in the hierarchy. Very good. Well, I kind of right. like the idea that it simulations all the way up. <laughs> <laughs> so I like to inject aliens into a lot of conversations, but I think, I, I think this is an interesting thought experiment because nobody ever uses alien for creator, right? But, you know, in some sense, you're you're hypothesizing about an intelligent being uh, other than us. Um, and I think when you're talking about the simulation argument, people will agree that if we encounter aliens on another world, and if we're in a simulation, it's still first contact. And so my question is, if we simulate aliens, is that first contact? Uh, interesting. We've done that already, right? Yeah. I don't know. Video, right. video games? Well, no, or, 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 or a, a, a GPT. I mean, you know, if you spend time interacting with it, I mean, you do have the feeling that you are talking to an alien, right? You are talking to like, a, you new, a, new, a new kind of intelligence that exists on Earth that did not five years ago. Of course, it is not a kind of intelligence that arose independently from humans. So in that sense, it is fundamentally different from like meeting an you know, extraterrestrial from another planet. Well, let's all thank our speakers. Firstly, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. There's now a website, kurtjimungle.org, and that has a mailing list. The reason being that large platforms like YouTube, like Patreon, they can disable you for whatever reason, whenever they like. That's just part of the terms of service. Now, a direct mailing list ensures that I have an untrammeled communication with you. Plus, soon I'll be releasing a one-page PDF of my top 10 toes. It's not as Quentin Tarantino as it sounds like. Secondly, if you haven't subscribed or clicked that like button, now is the time to do so. Why? Because each subscribe each like helps YouTube push this content to more people like yourself. Plus, it helps out Kurt directly, a.k.a. me.
I also found out last year that external links count plenty toward the algorithm, which means that whenever you share on Twitter, say on Facebook or even on Reddit, etc., it shows YouTube, hey, people are talking about this content outside of YouTube, which in turn greatly aids the distribution on YouTube. Thirdly, there's a remarkably active Discord and subreddit for Theories of Everything, where people explicate toes, they disagree respectfully about theories, and build as a community our own toe. Links to both are in the description. Fourthly, you should know this podcast is on iTunes, it's on Spotify, it's on all of the audio platforms. All you have to do is type in Theories of Everything and you'll find it. Personally, I gained from re-watching lectures and podcasts. I also read in the comments that, hey, Toll listeners also gain from replaying. So how about instead you re-listen on those platforms like iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, whichever podcast catcher you use. And finally, if you'd like to support more conversations like this, more content like this, then do consider visiting patreon.com slash Mungle and donating with whatever you like. There's also PayPal. There's also crypto. There's also just joining on YouTube. Again, keep in mind, it's support from the sponsors and you that allow me to work on Toe full time. You also get early access to ad-free episodes, whether it's audio or video. It's audio in the case of Patreon, video in the case of YouTube. For instance, this episode that you're listening to right now was released a few days earlier. Every dollar helps far more than you think. Either way, your viewership is generosity enough. Thank you so much.